hello, and it's lovely to be with you all. Even though I can't see you, I know you're there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about living a meaningful life, because for me, a meaningful life is a happy life. In 1983, when I was given three months to live, I fully expected to die, and I prepared to die. I wrote my will, I finalised all of my affairs, uh, my children went to live with their father, and I prepared to die. And I entered a little cave outside of Assisi in Italy. And it was in that cave, really, that the whole of my life unravelled. Because up until then, I had coped with everything. And I imagine some of you come from a long history where you just keep on keeping on and you cope no matter how challenging or difficult the circumstances of your life might be. And mine weren't any more particularly challenging than other people's. It was just that I lived with a split reality where I was someone very, very privately to myself. And then there was the version of me that I kept highly polished for everyone else. I had my whole life all packed up in this little suitcase, all ready for the big trip. I'd given away all of my possessions, I'd organised all of my affairs, and so I was all ready for this big trip, and then the plane got cancelled. <laughs> and I was faced with, how much do you unpack the suitcase? How much do you live as if you're really going to be here? And how do you know that you've lived a meaningful life, a good life? And what's a good way to spend a life? And since then, I obviously didn't die back then, but since then, I've been very privileged to share the story with over 100,000 people now who've bumped into some kind of we call them the Ds in life. And it might be a disappointment, a drama, a disaster, a divorce, a disability, a diagnosis, a death, a dementia, a downturn, a drought, a debt. There are lots of Ds. And when you bump into one of these Ds in life, everything that's second nature to you doesn't work. It might be second nature for you to isolate yourself, to withdraw from the world. It might be second nature to you to blame other people for your own unhappiness. It might be second nature to you to go into an old familiar pattern of, I do it myself. I bet there are a few people in the audience like that. That was a big one for me. I do it myself. And of course, some of these beliefs have little grandchildren. If you've got, I do it myself, you've probably also got, if you want it done properly, you do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> It might be second nature to you to drown your sorrows, to drug yourself, to numb yourself. It might be second nature to you to fill up your life with so much busyness you don't even have time to feel. And it's interesting that we use this expression because people say, oh, it's second nature for me to feel like this. It's second nature for me to think this way. It's second nature for me to react like this. And no one ever questions, well, what is your first nature? And we seem to know and feel very comfortable in the world of what is second nature to us. It's second nature to us to judge others. It's second nature to us to judge ourselves. It's second nature for us to do a whole range of things. But the issue is when you face one of these Ds in life, it often gives you the impetus to want things to be really different. You see, we're so often happy with mediocrity. We're so happy with the I'll be happy when journey. I'll be happy when I get the qualification. I'll be happy when I go on holidays. I'll be happy when I've got enough money. I'll be happy when I find the perfect partner. Happy when I get married. Happy when I have children. Happy when they leave. Happy when the divorce comes through. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're very deeply programmed to always postpone our sense of happiness and contentment to a future time when things look different from how they are in this moment. 
And that's why suffering is so fantastic. Because it's often suffering that causes you to stop in your tracks and to recognize, I want peace more than anything. More than being right. More than hanging on to righteous indignation. I want peace more than blame. I want peace more than a cure. Because once you get to that place, the whole universe shifts and everything that you've been looking for to bring you happiness up until now no longer matters because peace is what happens, ha matters more than anything. And once we get to that place where we say, that's it, something has to change and it's me. I can't change the outer circumstance. What I can change is who I'm going to be in relationship to that. Am I going to be defined by that or can I be more than that? You see, if I could see you, I know that you all scrub up really well. <laughs> <laughs> and yet behind the facade of how you look, if we had time to hear your stories, we would hear stories of anguish, stories of despair, of isolation, of loneliness. We'd hear stories of grief and sorrow because these things often don't show on the outside, but they're our inner reality. And the issue becomes, how do we get into right relationship with our suffering? How do we anchor our sense of self in that which is beyond change? Because if you anchor your sense of self in your physical body, as many people do, how it looks, how it functions, what you can do with your physical body. But even if you live to 110, your body will become saggy and baggy and grey and wrinkly and bits will fall off and wear out. <laughs> <laughs> so anchoring your sense of self in your physical body is to anchor your sense of self in that which will change. If you anchor your sense of self in your mind, well, most people's minds are forever projecting five seconds, weeks, months, years into the future, or five seconds, weeks, months, years into the past. And when our mind goes into the future and we fear and panic and worry and fill ourselves with all the things that might happen, could happen, and probably won't happen, or we go into resenting, blaming, shaming, trying to rewrite history in our mind. So if we anchor our sense of self in our mind, it's going to change all the time too. Our feelings change all the time. I remember when I thought I was dying one day, uh, I was kind of marinating in a, a, a self-pity party at this time. And my parents, I would, moved in with my parents and they lived above Middle Harbour and here's this whole beautiful harbour. And one day a little bird flew past and normally there were big noisy parrots in this valley above Chinaman's Beach. But when this little bird flew past, my mind went out, what was that? And then I saw my mind label it, oh, it's a sparrow. And I saw myself returning to my morass of self-pity. And I thought, hang on a minute, what's the reality of my despair? When in that moment there was curiosity, and then I saw myself returning to despair. So I thought, that's very unreliable. Who's in control? Who's in charge? So if we anchor our sense of self in our mind, we're lost, because it's forever changing. Our feelings are forever changing. And if we want to find the peace that passes all understanding, we need to anchor our sense of self in that which is beyond change. And that isn't something that's easy, because the body is so seductive, the mind is so seductive, our feelings are so seductive, to say that this is my reality, my physical reality, my mental, my emotional reality. And so these are your only priorities between now and death. If you want to be at peace with yourself and at peace with the world in which you live and to be in service in the unique way that can only be contributed by you, then these are your priorities between now and death. You are not your body. 
you have a body. And you need to nourish your physical body appropriately. And basically, human beings have been eating, if you think of slow food, seasonal, local, organic, whole food for millennia. It's only in the last hundred years we've started significantly interfering with our food supply. And now we're putting into and onto our bodies all sorts of things that aren't really meant to be there. So you need to nourish your body appropriately. You need to rest it because this is a culture that soldiers on, that wears it as a badge of honour, that we have endless energy and that we can constantly be out there overdoing things. You need to exercise your body because it's designed for movement. It's a whole system of pumps. And you need to know how to fluff your body up, how to make yourself feel good. You might be an ocean person or a desert person, and those are the environments in which your body feels enlivened. So you're not your body, but you do need to nourish it, rest it, exercise it, fluff it up and make it feel good. You're not your mind. You have a mind. And the mind makes a marvellous servant and an appalling master. You need to quieten down your mind on a daily basis. In fact, on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Because when you live with a quiet mind, you have access to your intuition, your insight, your wisdom, your humor, your spontaneity. And when the mind is caught up in the future or in the past, you lose all of the possibilities that exist in the present. So you need to keep your mind quiet. And that usually takes practice. You need to keep your mind in good company. Good company is not just the people you spend time with. It's the music you listen to, the books you read, the television you watch, the environments you put yourself into. Be in company that uplifts you, inspires you, encourages you. Don't hang out with turkeys. <laughs> Don't hang out with gossip. But you see, when you say this to some people, there goes the family. <laughs> there go all your friends. For some people, their whole life has been consumed by the feeding off other people's stories. So be in good company. It's better to have good company in poetry, in nature, in a piece of music, in a daily ritual of lighting candles, of prayer, of yoga, of whatever it is, than to hang out and diminish who you are by the company that you keep. So keep your mind in good company. You're not your feelings. You have feelings. And we need to become aware of what is this that I'm feeling and if I need to express it, how can I do that in a way that won't wound myself or anyone else? We wound ourselves by some of the behaviours of whether it's overeating, over drinking, over whatever it is. Or we wound others through our words and actions. So if you're not your body, you have one. You're not your mind, you have access to mind. You're not your feelings, you have feelings. Of course it begs the question, who am I? And when we anchor our sense of self in that which is beyond change, and we have a quiet mind and an awareness about what's going on within ourselves and within our environment, and we listen to our intuition and are guided moment by moment, in how to make a contribution in this moment. That's the piece that passes all understanding. Because what's the greatest gift you can give into chaos, into conflict, into despair, into anguish? It's going to be the gift of your own peace. Because with peace comes intuition, Clarity, insight, wisdom, humour, all of those things that we so value when we live in a complex and now rapidly changing world. This doesn't happen haphazardly. It's not easy, but it's essential. If we're to find a way of making the contribution that can only be made by you, 
then we need to find that peace that passes all understanding. And that means you need to divvy up your 168 hours every week. We checked it out internationally. Everybody gets 168 hours. <laughs> Doesn't matter who you are, what you do. And you need to divvy up those 168 hours so that you fluff yourself up first. Then you're going to bring your well-fluffed-up self to the challenge, to the chaos, to the confusion, to the despair, to the crisis. Isn't that better than bringing your exhausted, emotionally frazzled, depressed, irritable self to those circumstances? And the greatest gift you can give into such challenging, um, amazing opportunities that we have right now. Because if you don't have a personal D going on in your life, we're now facing a collective D on the planet. And that could be human, human beings' demise. Given that there are so many challenges right now, what's the part that you came here to play? Divvy up your 168 hours every week so that you fluff yourself up. Then you're going to bring your well-replenished self to make the contribution that can only be made by you. And of course, the only place that you see this actively promoted is on aeroplanes. They say, when the mask comes down, first put the mask on you, then on the other passengers. And yet, how often are we putting masks on everyone else without ever considering? Have we looked after ourselves? Have we just taken responsibility, our ability to respond to the fact that we are enmeshed, consciousness enmeshed in the physical, and that it's our responsibility to take good care of ourselves physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, so that we can be here, play the part that we came here to play, make the contribution that we came here to make. And that doesn't happen haphazardly. And don't wait for a D to have the motivation to do it. Because it's much better to learn from others who might have suffered and who've discovered these things for themselves than to go through that suffering yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you.